evening, everybody. This is Victoria, your dog guru, and today we have a very special guest. Her name is Jane Miller. She's the author of Healing Companions, Ordinary Dogs and Their Extraordinary Power to Transform Lives. So she will be joining us on the phone. So without further ado, this is Jane Miller. Hello, Jane. Hey, Victoria. How are you? So good. So happy to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, we're very excited because we have a strong following of all levels of service dogs and support dogs. So I know a lot of owners are interested in what you have to say. So how did you get into this? What made you fall in love with this? Well, uh, you know, sometimes life takes you on a journey and it just fits right exactly where it's meant to be. Amen, so, sister. So, long story short, without going into too much detail, in fourth grade, <laughs> it started there. Um, I came home from school and I told my mother that I wanted to be Jane Goodall. Oh, and, I love her. Yeah. So she was like the beginning of my path to trying to figure out how I could work with animals and integrate the healing power of animals with healing of humans. Right. And on this path that I, that I was taken by my loves, which are animals and human beings, mm-hmm. I ended up going into the field of being a psychotherapist. But at the same time, I was really um, trying to figure out how to incorporate not only animals, but all the holistic and complementary healing modalities. I studied extensively stress reduction techniques, neurosciences, animal behavior, um, animal ethology. So there was this intertwining of psychology and biology throughout my life. Yes. And I ended up going to school to become a psychotherapist. And I'd like to kind of read a little bit from my book that will explain how this all started for me. And it really started with the first golden retriever that entered my life when I had just bought my home Mm -hmm. and she really led the way. And I want to read a little bit about how that all evolved and and happened. In a fast paced world, doctors are often quick to advise patients suffering from traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and other emotional and psychological problems that their ills can be solved through the use of one medication or another. Too many people think the pill itself is, in quotes, a magic bullet Mm -hmm. that will make their lives happier, easier, and more secure. It isn't. Medications must be taken under careful supervision, and many antidepressant drugs carry the risk of negative side effects, including in extreme cases, suicidal tendencies. Although many individuals do require medication, which has helped countless people, there are other pill-free choices that are extremely beneficial and may not have been considered. For many people, one choice that they may have never heard of, either by itself or in combination with drug therapy and psychotherapy, might make all the difference. Service dogs have been assisting the blind, the hearing impaired, and those in wheelchairs and with other disabilities for a long time. There are also therapy dogs who help enhance quality of life for many people by visiting hospitals, nursing homes, and other institutions providing comfort and support. Umaya's strength, that's the dog that I wanted to share about, oh. and calming influence were a revelation to me. And when I saw the way that my clients responded to her, I began to realize that having a dog could have a profound impact on some of my clients' lives. This is not this, just the story of our journey, however. It's a window into the world of psychiatric service dogs for people with invisible disabilities showing how the dogs can change and enhance the lives of their human companions. In the following chapters, we'll meet some of these amazing dogs and see how they have helped a number of individuals improve their lives in profound and unexpected ways, allowing them to gain self-esteem, self-confidence, assertiveness, and so much more. These dogs provide emotional support, as all dogs do, but they are specifically trained to perform certain tasks unique to the individual's needs. Through the stories of these dogs, I hope to show you how you, a friend or a family member, how he or she might benefit from such a healing companion. In addition to these remarkable stories, this book will also explain which dogs are the right candidates for the job, which dogs are not, and how to tell the difference. Here's a hint. It has nothing to do with the dog's breed. Mixed breed dogs are very well suited to assist those with invisible disabilities. 
Those dogs can be in-home companions or full-time service dogs who also accompany their companion out in public and to work. To work. I'll discuss how these dogs are trained, how the dog may impact other members of the family, and how to make life more comfortable and less stressful for the dogs while they are undertaking their essential tasks. I'll also provide a helpful list of resources. So I hope this book will serve as an informative, practical, inspirational guide. Umaya started me on this extraordinary path. Now share the journey of my clients and others who have opened their hearts to a service dog and found healing beyond their expectations. So Umaya ended up when she was four years old with fibrosarcoma. And the chemotherapy that she was needing at that time was very close to my office. So she started coming to work. And here you have this golden retriever who had just got received chemotherapy, who clearly, uh, she was shaved in the back and it was on her back right hip that this occurred. And you could tell, you know, here she was going through a difficult traumatic experience, but filled with lust, a lust for life. And she would come into the waiting room and we called it, I don't know if any of you have golden retrievers, uh, she would make the rounds and she would go <laughs> into the room delivering toys to every person in the, in the waiting room and try to get them to play with her. Well, that was the beginning. And then what happened was I was seeing lots of clients with very severe mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd have clients on the floor sharing these very intense histories of trauma, of incest, of abuse, and they'd be petting Amaya and they didn't even realize what they were telling me. Right. And it was just surreal to watch the change that happened within just my therapy process and in the therapeutic milieu. Mm -hmm. So I had one client who ended up uh, going through a very, very difficult period, ended up in a psych ward. And at the end, when she was getting ready to be discharged, she said to me, Jane, I want an Amaya. And I was like, you want an Amaya? And I'm like, you, you can barely take care of yourself and you want a dog? Well, <laughs> I, I looked at her and I said, well, I, I think that we really need to explore this. And this was in the mid-1990s when the ADA was enacted, which right. expanded the whole landscape of what was available for people with, um, people with disabilities. And the inclusion then was uh, broadened to include people with mental health issues and mental illness. And so the, that just changed the whole ability for people with not only epilepsy and chemical uh, sensitivity and, and diabetes and mobility issues. Well, we already had mobility, but it expanded the ability for them to have psychiatric, to have service dogs. Right. And, uh, in addition, psychiatric service dogs. So I said to this client of mine, who's the first chapter of my book, that, you know, what about not an Omaya, but a service dog to help you be able to function? Right. And so that's where it all started. And so Umaya was what she thought she needed, but she ended up with a service dog. As a matter of fact, it's really what kept her alive while she was getting ready to leave the hospital. The first place we went after she was released was the shelter, and we got her her first dog. Aww. And that was the beginning. And it just took off from that point forward. And now to give a little history, that this is what you started your, your question was, how did I get where I am today? It's just kind of, like I said, fell into my lap because I had already been training dogs. Right. I'd been training, I'd been training dogs. I'd been studying animal behavior and dog behavior. My first animals, I have a number of different certifications under my belt, but my first animals were um, kangaroos. I studied extensively. Um, and I looked at the behavior of kangaroos in the wild versus in captivity. Mm -hmm. uh, I also studied um, and ha did a lot of work with birds. And I went to the British School of Falconry and learned about hawk handling. Oh, I would and love that. <laughs> it was amazing. And I will say the very first class we had was really what I, I teach people to do with dogs, which is 
breathing techniques because birds are incredibly sensitive to our emotional state. And if we're scared of them coming to fly and land on our arm, they will not come near us. And so we did what what's called hawk handling and a hawk walk where the hawk bonded with you and then would walk with you, not on your arm, but up in the sky mm -hmm. and come down at the end of the walk and land back on your arm and follow you through the woods. And it was just amazing. It was that very sounds like an incredible experience. That's right up my alley. Yeah. You would have loved it. It's a great place. It was, uh, that was my 50th birthday present for my mother. She uh, sent me there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which I, was I, 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 I want her to adopt me. That yeah, she, it was plan. great. It was, it was one of the most extreme, extraordinary weekends of my life. I, I just had, you know, and it was amazing. So I've always had this real interest in animals and have been a vegetarian since fourth grade. So, you know, it all kind of coalesced, but yep. um, what I think is so critical is that if people are doing this work, it's so essential that you not only know how to train dogs, but that you understand mental health and mental illness. Yes. Because one of the concerns I have with what's happening with, um, and we see this probably um, more extensively now because of the veterans, so many organizations are popping up to, to provide veterans that are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder with service dogs, but they don't really understand the complexities of how that mental health issue impacts that person. Right. And what is dissociation? What can that dog do to alert or in, in, interrupt uh, a person when they are dissociating? Right. So from my perspective, if anyone goes into this field, they need to collaborate and work with mental, Ill mental health professionals yeah. and make sure that they're addressing that individual's needs. What's so unique about my work and what I love, I, I guess, the most is the creativity of the tasks that the dogs are trained to do are so incredibly powerful because every single one of my clients has different needs. Right. So one person might have an eating disorder and I've trained the dog to go get the food every few hours if they have anorexia. And if, if they are an overeater, the dog might block them from going to the fridge. You know, a lot of people that have eating disorders, they uh, eat while they're moving, while they're pacing, or mm -hmm. they don't even realize they're putting food in their mouth while right. they're walking yeah. around. So I train the dog to go to the person and hold onto their sleeve and tug them to a chair. And then this person got really kind of just upset when anyone would stare at her. So the dog would just sit there staring at her, which made her realize that she was eating the whole, oh, the whole bag of potato chips. <laughs> so she stopped overeating and she lost quite a bit of weight. It was very interesting that's that incredible. And, and having to walk the dog. So that's just one very small, specifically tailored to that individual training process. And that can be for if they have obsessive compulsive disorder, the dog interrupts them from, you know, pulling at their hair or biting their nails. Um, a lot of my clients have what we call hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. And if that, if you don't know what that is, that that's kind of when you're like, say you're in the grocery store and someone gets too close behind you, the dog will block them from getting too close behind that person by either lying down behind them mm -hmm. or sitting neck behind them. Um, so the dog knows uh, like behind sides and can help in that realm. I have trained dogs to do what we call room checks. So if you come home at night and you're terrified of coming home to a dark house, the dog runs through the house and checks every room. And obviously dogs will let you know if something's awry, awry and not right. right. Um, but I've trained the dogs to go into every room and turn on the lights so that you're not coming into a dark house. Those are just a few simple examples of what we're capable of doing and what dogs are capable of doing, which I think is really incredible. So, so let me ask that. you something, yeah. you know, yeah. for yeah. our listeners that perhaps do not have a service dog, maybe they haven't even been exposed directly to a service dog. 
Okay. What is advice that you would have to somebody who is green and okay. doesn't know what's involved? I mean, like you said, these are invisible disabilities. Yes. I mean, for all things considered, a lot of people may not know that this dog has a purpose. So what would be your advice to somebody who sees a dog in a foreign environment like that where they're not expecting it and they decide to approach? Or what are some of the things that can really trigger a patient of, like yours? Yeah. Well, I think that's such a great question because I think part of it is that the businesses don't understand what's a, what's okay, what's not, and what's legal and what's not legal. And it's very important that the uh, handler, the person, the client, mm -hmm. um, have the knowledge of how to handle situations because not only do you have an invisible disability, but, and people can't tell, well, you know, I don't see a cane. Um, it's, it's amazing when I tell you that I can't tell you how many times I've been out with my clients and we'd be going to a doctor's appointment and I'd be going with them because we were training the dog and the uh, receptionist would hand me the paperwork to fill out because she's they assumed she was blind oh. so the assumptions that get made one of the things we talk a lot about is I educate my clients to be able to um, be assertive and say look my dog is working please don't interrupt my dog my dog needs to pay attention to me right now I have an invisible disability invisible disabilities include so if they don't want to say um, I'm bipolar or, you know, I, I have a mental health issue. Yeah, they don't have to elaborate. They don't have elaborate. to. It's nobody's business. Who, right. who wants to share their personal? It's personal. But and now if, if they got confronted by the owner of the business, that's a different answer. But we won't go yeah. there. But right. by just some stranger, you don't have to. It's HIPAA. You know, you have the right, right. to privacy. So then you can list invisible disabilities. Uh, invisible disabilities include epilepsy, chemical sensitivities, um, diabetes, uh, you know, so many other things that it, yes. they don't have to assume it's mental health if you're not comfortable sharing that. But right. I'll tell you, the majority of my clients really want people to know that they have mental health issues because they want people to see that just because um, I deal with post-traumatic stress disorder it doesn't mean I can't function. Correct. And so, you know, more power to them. If they want to say that, that's fine, but that's up to them. The most important thing is that it's very stressful, but it's also sometimes incredibly self-confidence building because here you are going into a store where that is stressful in and of itself, but you've got your dog there. And most people that inter intrude, <laughs> they just want to talk about dogs. Yeah. And that's an easy topic. You can tell them about your dog. Oh, what breed is she? Oh my God, where'd you get her? She's so beautiful. You know, can I pet your dog? No, she's working. They can let people pet the dog if they want to. Some of my clients, uh, all my clients have their dogs vested just because it does seem to prevent as much intrusion. Right. Uh, and it says on the vet, the vest, do not pet. Dog is working, service dog. It doesn't say psychiatric service dog. It just says service dog. Right. But they will take the vest off and then you can pet the dog because then the dog knows it's not working at that Yeah, moment. there's a, there's a different, they, they, they know the difference between when they're vested and they're not. Oh, yeah. And, oh, and gotcha. Just for people who are listening, if you didn't know this, dogs that are service animals do not have to be vested. They don't right. have to be, they don't have to have outward identifiers. So right. just because you see a dog out doesn't mean it's a pet. It could, you know, there, it's no different than a medical device that like an oxygen tank. Right. But I will say they have to be behaving. <laughs> yes, I agree. And well, no, that's not just an agree. That's when a store can kick them out. Yes. Whether they're a service dog or not, if your dog is causing disruption, that's not okay. Just like if your wheelchair was, you know? Right. If you're in a movie theater and your dog starts barking, that's not a well-trained service dog, you right. know? And of course, you know, there are days where our dogs are off and shit can happen, but, excuse my language. Oh, no, but, you're fine. <laughs> you know, I, I think that it's really important that we have what I hate the word. It's called bomb proof. Our dogs really have to be bomb proof, mm -hmm. but they're also dogs. And right. one of the things that's so critical is that they get, they just like people. And this is really essential 
when you're dealing with uh, people with mental health issues, the dogs need playtime. They need downtime. They need balance in their lives. One of the things I love about dogs is they, like most humans, we need some, some amount of routine. Mm-hmm. And if your dog eats breakfast, you're going to eat breakfast. If your dog gets you up out of bed and get, you're not going to go out in the cold without clothes on, it gets you to go outside, take, you out, take the dog out. You come back in, you give your dog their pills, you take your own pills. So they really can help my clients with having a routine and learning about balance in one's life. So when you first take on a client and you think that a service dog would be a great addition to their lives to help them live a normal life in a public format or even just at home, what does that process look like to them? Is it a six-month process? Is it a two-year process? I kind of already know the answer to this, but (laughs) I just want others who do not know to get your perspective. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to answer this uh, sharing our program. It's been rare, and I don't do this very often, to have a psych client, a a therapeutic relationship client. I do have that based on some history, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, them getting a a psychiatric service dog. Most of the people come to me referred from other therapists. Now, our program is in Northeast Ohio. And the way we work, and this is because I found this to be the best way for my clientele, and everybody's different how they do these things. Because my, my clients really couldn't handle puppies. Puppies are high, high energy. They, you know, it's like having a two-year-old, and they're struggling enough taking care of themselves. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of management is involved with puppies. Yeah, it's, and it's 24-7, and, you know, you're not going to get as much sleep, and you, they might not even be uh, house-trained, so all of that. And it's a lot more intensive training. So the dogs that are in my program are all shelter and rescue dogs. Oh, I love and that. So all, my, all the dogs have also had some level of, well, not all of them, but m- almost all of the dogs have had some level of trauma in their history which can be very powerful when you have a dog that's also connected basically because they've experienced something similar and they might have some stress issues. And I'll share a story about that after I finish our program Mm -hmm. Uh, and remind me to, because it's about thunderstorms and how this dog uh, and this human work together to get over both their fears of thunderstorms, but that's a whole different story. Um, (laughs) It can be very powerful, but all the dogs are shelter rescue dogs and they, they, I train them at the local prison with the inmates. So there are 20 inmates in the program and there are two inmates per dog. So there are 10 dogs and, um, the inmates, one is a primary and one is a secondary. And the primary is kind of the one that's been in the program longer and trains the secondary to learn Oh, not only relaxation, stress reduction techniques for humans and their animals, but body language, um, all positive reward-based training. They learn clicker training. They learn the quadrants. They learn why we use positive reward-based um, training. And they call me the, the loose leash lady. I'm the loose leash lady. So there's no <laughs> pulling. They're not allowed to pull the dogs. The dogs have harnesses that are no pull harnesses. You know, it's it's really all about treating the dogs with respect and integrity and building a trust and a bond. And so all these dogs then ha- get their basic training at the prison. They pass what we call the class test, C-L-A-S-S. Um, and that's very similar to the Canine Good Citizens test. And then they are ready to be adopted if if that's where they're heading. Um, and, or if they qualify, they enter into my program. What does that mean? That means, are they the right, mostly what distinguishes a qualified dog and a non-qualified dog are a few factors, but the one of the most important is the age. They have to be within a year and a half to two years old, because I don't want them too old because the process of training them is extensive. And so we're looking at a year and a half to two years of training and we don't want them to have to retire. Right. So we have as much time as possible. So most of the dogs that enter into my program, and they, the other thing that we look for is temperament, 
And, and, you know, are they trainable? You know, a lot of different factors come into that. But when I have a dog that looks like she's, she or he is going to be a potential, I'll start having the guys maybe work on some more advanced skills like targeting. They learn how to use their paws, their, their, their noses for nudging. Um, and, and we really start getting a little more advanced. But at this point, mostly what they have under their belt is a good heel, come, recall, sit. Um, they have their basics. Uh, they have settle. They have go to their mats, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then they come out, they're adopted then by the person who I've done an intake, extensive intake with, and, you know, really come to the point of they're ready to adopt a dog. They meet this dog, and if it's a match, great. If it's not, we have other people. So that's, that's you know, we find the right person for that dog. Right. And match that dog with that person. They adopt the dog. And then they start the process of working with me every week for an hour a week with the training. And that consists of public access training. Now, that's not just walking in stores. Yes, it's important that they learn how to walk into stores and be right. able to behave and hear all kinds of noises. But what they also learn is how to tuck their tail so their tail isn't sticking out so people, when they come through the restaurant, aren't going to step on their tails curling up in a small ball so that if they go on airplanes, they can fit under the seats. Learning how to, what I call not hoover, they can't be going into a movie theater and picking up all the popcorn, you know, and, and <laughs> they have to really, and I'll tell you, my golden retriever. A four-legged would, Dyson. Yeah, really, she would not make it. She's a hoover, major eureka. Uh, so with all that being said, there are lots of things that, they have to become adapted to and adjusted to and comfortable with, whether it's going into an elevator or, um, you know, going into a very noisy place or here's a good one, a movie theater, back to the movie theater, a dark place, you know, right. that the lights go out and then the sound goes up and, they have and their sensory is on overload. They're like, what is all of this? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so we teach the dogs, we, we teach the human how to, relax the dogs. So the dogs and the human will do breathing exercises together so that they can learn how to calm each other if the place or the environment is overstimulating for both of them. So right. it's, it's, that's what's really beautiful. So I'll go back to that story I was about to tell you about the thunderstorms. Um, this client, her name is Tracy, and she is in the book as well. She ha uh, has severe post-traumatic stress disorder, she was emotionally, physically, and physically abused as a child. So her second dog, um, but her second dog was a Katrina rescue dog. And her name was Finola, and she's, a, she's all over my website. She's a beautiful white dog. She, when she first arrived from the hurricane, I met her, and I was like, oh, my gosh, you got to be kidding. This dog was not exactly what I would choose as a potential service dog. But it was interesting her previous service dog was the calmest, most easygoing, pretty much a couch potato. Right. <laughs> and, and my client was a couch potato at that point. And she was so depressed. And it was a perfect match. The two of them really just enjoyed watching TV together. And it was great. And Baron really helped her get to need, be ready for a Fanola. Fanola was high energy, just a lust for life. And oh my gosh got Tracy out of the house. Fanola really was exactly what she needed, but one of the issues that arose was, here's this dog that su survived the hurricane. So we would- Terrified of storms. Oh my God, yeah. But not only storms, wind. So we would be right. walking and if it were windy out and any kind of trash can or anything started rolling and getting pushed by the wind, my gosh, this dog was having complete panic attack. <laughs> and. So we, we did something that was really great um, because Tracy really had a hard time functioning and would have terrible panic attacks and, and be hiding in, a, in, in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so rather than both hiding in the bathroom together, we decided to train Fanola and Tracy to love thunderstorms. We went outside in the middle of thunderstorms and we had a party. The dog had the party of having treats thrown all over the place and having a good time. And good Tracy association dancing there. around singing to Fanola. What was so incredible was 
within about you know a few months, Vanilla would be pulling her out the door to go play when when a thunderstorm came. And she would get excited too. She started loving thunderstorms, and so did the dog. It was a beautiful, like they helped each other get over a Trauma. trigger. And yep. so, you know, people always are saying, oh, shelter dogs, you can't do that. You know, they've got their histories. Well, that's like saying mentally ill people have their histories, that we all have our histories. Right. And we can overcome them and we can learn how to cope with them. It's a wonderful story. And there are a lot of different. I mean, and and some of our listeners don't know this either. There are lots of different jobs that a service animal will have. Um, But when you're talking about invisible disabilities, perhaps they don't want to talk about it, like you said. And and there are many, you know, concerns that they may have inwardly that you can't see outwardly. And so I feel like the fact that you're educating a mass of people, opening yourself up to something that a lot of people haven't, you know, seen beyond the curtain before. Well, and one of my big goals and missions is to take the I out of mental illness and change it to we in mental wellness so we can all come together to support each other with becoming mentally well and not have it be so stigmatized. Yes. Just, you know, it's outrageous that in this day and age, you know, and at least we're starting to talk about things. My gosh, this has been happening for years and it's always been under the carpet and people don't talk about it. And what's great is when, when my clients come out about being, you know, having uh, multiple personality, which is now DID, dissociative identity disorder, they discover there are a number of other people out there with it. You know, it's like, yes. oh my gosh, I didn't know you. Oh my gosh, you know. So it, it really helps open that door and not be feeling silenced who you are and what you deal with and what you cope with. And I just wanted to tell people how to find you. Where do they find you? Where, where can they find your book? My address? Uh, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my book is called Healing Companions, Ordinary Dogs and Their Extraordinary Power to Transform Lives. And my book is available through Amazon. Go to my uh, Amazon Smiles link and we get a percentage of what you spend. Oh, so I love that. A wonderful way to give a donation that you're not even realizing you're making because it's uh, not costing you any more. And at your local bookstore, you can have the moderate. They can get it. That would be probably the best thing. If you want a signed copy, we have a local bookstore in Oberlin, Ben Franklin's Mind Fair Books. You can look it up on Google and I'd be happy to sign it and they will then ship it to you once you give them your credit card information. With all that being said, you can find me at www healing-companions.org. And if you want to contact me, please feel free to email me at jmiller at oberlin. That's O-B as in boy, E-R-L-I-N dot net. My phone number is 1-800-457-0345. And just to let you know, we are always looking for volunteers and most, the majority of our volunteers are virtual. Mm-hmm. So you can be anywhere and help spread the word through social media. Um, I have people that orchestrate our social media platforms. So you would work with my board member that is the social media facilitator. That, and we can send you links and information to help us. If you belong, go to Volunteer Match and you can help us with oh, not only fundraising, but letting people know about our, our work, uh, sharing news about our events. We have events coming up this weekend. On Sunday, we'll be giving a webinar called Dogs Have Issues Too. And it's going to be about stress reduction techniques for humans and their animals that I teach because of my um, knowledge in canine massotherapy, acupressure points, and Reiki. It's an integration of a lot of different modalities of healing that can help that our animals be able to handle stressful situations and be relaxed so their cortisol levels don't go too high, as well as our own. We're always having events and always love to hear from people. Let me know what you thought of today's show. And if you have any questions, just shoot me an email or give me a call. I'm here to help any way I can. Yes, we're really, really fortunate to have had you, and I'm so grateful that you came on the show. I'd love to have you back, because I know we're going to get a flood of emails about this. People are always writing in with questions, and because okay. of you alone, I'm sure I'm going to get some of them. If they want, you will you can just forward them to me, and I will answer all of them. We're committed to making sure everyone gets the information they need. 
a lot of people are labeling dog service dogs just because they want to take them places. And that is not at all the process involved. So I love that you take the time to teach the appropriate manners and the tasking that's required for the individual, but also the requirements that really keep service dogs a viable option for people who need them. Not only a viable option, but you need to think about if you're taking your dog into a store or into a place where your dog is not trained to be a service dog and then uh, causes a problem, you're, you're setting a precedent that does damage to people with disabilities having service dogs that aren't going to get discriminated against. Right. And having well-trained service dogs. Also, your dog could possibly have a conflict with the service dog. And these are $20,000 dogs. Yeah. And if one of them gets bitten and or traumatized, that can be the end of its working life. And that's not fair to you or the person that needs their dog to be able to function. You right. know, it's like you wouldn't bash a, a wheelchair or, you know, a, a, another modality of being able to navigate through someone's days. Um, and you won't, don't want to interfere in the properly trained and appropriately trained service dogs because I that agree. can really be damaging for the person and the dog. That's really critical to think about. No, I was just going to say, you know, I think that's an important point. And a lot of people who have service dogs don't feel comfortable saying out loud all of those things, especially if they have an invisible disability and anxiety or, or something like that, that really, it makes them uncomfortable to even engage with other people, let alone right. go through the litany of why they don't want someone's stranger dog approaching their dog. <laughs> right, right. And, and most people will say, well, my dog's well behaved. That's not the point. Your right. dog is not a service dog. It, it is illegal to bring in a dog that's a pet into a restaurant, into right. a grocery store. This is not something that you have a conversation about. This is that you don't do it because it's not appropriate. We live in a country where that's not okay. And you, got, you need to abide by the laws because you're going to do more harm than good for people that have struggled to fight for their rights to be able to function at a higher level. Well... I'm really honored that you joined us today. I'm so, so grateful. Oh, my pleasure. I can't even tell you. And I feel like you're going to reach so many people in our audience that your voice is going to resonate with them. Either somebody they've been exposed to or something perhaps they're struggling with inwardly and don't feel comfortable really addressing. I feel like you've provided a lot of great resources for that. I'm going to include yeah. all of your goodies, all of your- oh, please do. Oh, yeah. Please do. yeah. And, and just let people know, I love what I do. I guess, you know, this is, this is not a job. This is my life. This is my passion. Mm -hmm. And if, if I'm in any way, shape or form, not relaying information accurately or in a way that people can hear it, I'd like that feedback as well. Okay. I am very open to having productive dialogues of how we can all grow and become better human beings. A big thank you to Jane Miller for joining us today on Dog Guru. I will have all of her contact information in the show notes, so definitely check that out. And in the meantime, if you liked our show, if you really liked our guest, please let us know. You can leave a comment. You can leave a review on iTunes. We would love to get your feedback and a five-star rating would be awesome also to keep us going. We're definitely reaching a whole new audience, a wider audience, and we're really proud of that. So thank you for sharing us and joining us. I will have lots more coming up for you. We have another episode of Coffee and Canines coming up here tomorrow. So if you have questions, it's not too late to submit them and they might end up on the air. In the meantime, be sure that you check us out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash dog guru podcast. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. We're everywhere and we're on seven or eight platforms right now uh, that hold our broadcast. So we're grateful for that, and we're going to keep them coming for you. But for now, this is Victoria, your dog guru. Namaste. Namaste.